When I was five years old, my parents moved to a, a new town to take over another parish. Dad was going to be a pastor there. And we went to visit a, a family that lived on a farm. And when we went there, I was told to stay in the front yard. Everybody was told to stay in the front yard and play there. But my curiosity got the best of me, and I, I wandered down the road to see what the countryside looked like and ended up witnessing a girl being molested by some older boys. Actually, she was kind of half and half participating, but only to be accepted. And I didn't understand what I was seeing. It, it horrified me. But I was blessed by the fact that I was in a new place and other kids, older kids, were including me. And I didn't have any friends there yet. We came to the farm on another occasion, and once again, I was told to stay in the yard. <laughs> and curiosity got the best of me, and I wandered down the road. And I came to a weeping willow tree by a white fence, and I looked out across the field, and I saw those boys again. They were in a field next to a grove of trees. Two of them were committing an act of homosexuality, which I really didn't understand. It horrified me and fascinated me at the same time. The last time I'd been there, they said, don't come back. And don't tell anybody what happened, because they were afraid I would tell somebody. When they saw that I'd come back, one of them saw me. He ran after me and knocked me down and, and squeezed me around the chest and then squeezed me in the groin and said, you thought you could spy on us, huh, little girl? And he just kept saying that over and over. You thought you could spy on us, huh, little girl? And every, said, every time he said, huh, little girl, he'd squeeze, and it was, he'd squeeze painfully. And, you know, when a group of boys is doing something like that, the powers of darkness join in, and they can end up doing things that, that they wouldn't normally do under the influence of those powers. And so they gathered around me, and, and one of them said, why don't you show them what you have? And he exposed himself to me. And then one of them pulled down my trousers and, and made fun of my body. And then I was molested. It was a gang rape by four teenage boys. There were six boys altogether, two abstained, but four of them molested me. And it was oral, done orally, and it was so brutal I could taste blood in the back of my throat. And then it, when it was done, and it, during the time when they were doing it, they were talking about me as a pretty little girl and all the things they'd like to do to that pretty little girl. And when they were done, they, one of them kicked me, and, and they told me, don't tell anybody, because if you do, we're going to hurt your parents. I think they might have even said, you, we're going to kill your parents. So I didn't tell anybody. And I just lived with the pain all by myself. And when you, you live with that much pain, you have to do something to numb yourself out. So within a couple days, I forgot it happened. And didn't remember until I was 29 years old. When it came up, it just came up all by itself. I wasn't even in counseling. I was just watching a sad movie. And when I came to the sad scene, I got a little teary-eyed. And then these scenes began to flash before my eyes. They began to come back to me. And I only remembered a little piece of it. And a couple months later, the same thing happened. And I remembered another little piece of it. And piece by piece, it spontaneously came back to me. I wondered, am I, am I making this up? Did it really happen? But ex it explained so many things in my life up until then. So when I told my parents about it when I was 30, my mom and dad said it had to have happened because exactly at that time when you say you remember it happening, your whole personality changed. You were just a normal little boy, and then suddenly you didn't like anything that had to do with boys. You didn't like to play with boys. You liked to play with girls and do girl things. And suddenly, out of the blue, 
you were just terribly ashamed to let anybody see your body. If mom walked in and you were in the bathtub, you would just be horrified and cover yourself up. And then what really confirmed to me that I was remembering something real was my sister Amy, who had been seven at the time and I had been five. She said, now I understand why. When we went to that same farm where you say that this happened, at that very age, why it was that we were playing in the front yard in that fenced area where we were supposed to play and you came running from behind the house and you were cupping your hands over your, your private area and she says you were literally jumping up and down with this absolutely terrified look in your eyes and, and she said I and my friend asked you what's wrong Mark, what's wrong and you said I can't tell, I'm not supposed to tell. And she said, you just said that, that over and over again, I can't tell, I'm not supposed to tell, and you just kept hiding yourself. Pure passion that beats for Christ alone. What happens with a child who is molested, especially if, he, if, he, if nobody was there to talk to, and especially if he had to suppress it in order to survive, is that he projects onto what he does know all the things that he, his mind doesn't know about what happened to him. What I mean is, for instance, when I looked at boys and I saw the rough and tumble way boys had, you know, there's this, this wonderful energy that boys have that's a good thing unless it gets out of hand, but it's a good thing. God created that, that energy, that boyish energy. When I saw it, it, it looked too much to me like the brutality that I experienced. I saw it through that lens, and so rough and tumble to me was ex expanded to look like brutality, and I hated it. I didn't like boy things from then on. Um, when I was a kid, my parents were just understanding, just beginning to find the basics of inner healing. All they knew about was bitter roots and inner vows and a few things back then. And they discovered the majority of what they know about inner healing after I went to college. But back then they just knew a few basics and they themselves were just beginning to heal. And so mom today, she's a very gentle person. People know her to be just a sweet spirited person. And anytime anybody meets her, that's what they see. But back then, she was a sweet-spirited person, but also she was angry back then and critical. But I would see that anger through the lens of the brutality that happened to me. And because I couldn't identify it, because I had forgotten it, then mom's anger became exaggerated. And so what happens with a child who's molested is that everything he looks at becomes seen through the eyes of what happened to him. And if he can't remember what happened to him, then all of what he felt back then gets projected onto what's happening now. The healing process for me was a couple of things. For one, it, it had to do with finding all those ways in which I chose to disconnect one by one. Choosing not to share with anybody, not to feel, not to need. Um, to disconnect from the good things that were in my parents. Every child has a tendency to uh, find great difficulty putting the good and bad together. When you're a little child, you, you live one moment at a time. You don't live in a continuum. So what happened was, it, with, with a small child, what happens is Mom and dad are the good guys, and there's these, these other people are the bad guys. A child lives with cops and robbers and good guys and bad guys. Everything's dichotomized. And mom and dad are supposed to be the good guys. And so what happens is, mom and every mom and dad have good traits and bad traits. Mom and dad are usually nice and gentle to you, and now and then they'll criticize or not understand you. And as a child, you react to that, but then you step out of that moment and you go back to your illusion that mom and dad are the good guys. And when you're teenagers, you begin to individuate. You begin to discover that, well, gee, mom and dad have bad traits and they have good traits. And 
By the time you're out of teenager, teenage you, years, you, you have it all put together. And you can retain a complete picture of who they are. When mom and dad are either abusive or when you've been abused, like I was, and you don't know how to do anything but project that abuse onto the people around you, then mom and dad's faults get greatly exaggerated. And it's so hard to come to that point where you put all the good and bad together. So you end up believing only one half or the other. They're all good or they're all bad. So for instance, with, with, with mom, she, when she was angry sometimes and gentle sometimes, I came to the point where I believed I just, I vowed in my heart to believe that the gentle part wasn't real. And so you're asking, how did I get healed? Well, here's one example of how I got healed. When I was married to Maureen, there was a week when she was really nice to me all week. She was gentle, loving. She did things for me. But once or twice, she got angry. And I got angry at her, and I said, you know, all week long, you've been criticizing me, you've been angry. And, and she reminded me of all the good things she'd done. And I realized I'd forgotten about every one of them. And I realized that was a pattern for years and years between us. The way you find healing is you find the pattern in the now. And if it's a pattern that's ongoing and you can't break it by mere willpower, by memorizing Bible verses, by worship, by just trying to change the behavior, then there's, there's something inside that's compelling you toward that pattern. I wanted to find out where it began. And when I realized I'd made that inner vow when I was little, that promise to myself that I wasn't going to believe that the gentleness was real. And I prayed with Maureen to renounce it then my eyes could be opened to see all of who Maureen was and not withdraw from all the goodness that was there. That's just one small example of how I came out of all the disconnections, not to share, not to need, not to believe in the goodness in people, etc. The other part of my healing, uh, the other major part, there are many parts, was that when I was little and I decided I wasn't going to tell anybody because they would hurt my parents, I, I just had to decide in my heart, I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be strong for myself. And there came a series of decisions made through the years, I have to be strong for myself. My parents are much more healed now. They were in the process of healing back then, and, and their greatest weakness at that time was they didn't know how to talk about emotions. And that was my greatest need at the time. And so if I began to sink into emotion, in, into depression, it was hard for them to believe that I could be that broken. And so they would minimize it and say, well, you're not that depressed. You're, you're, just, you're just sinking into a, a bad mood. You can snap out of it. And I couldn't snap out of it. So there was a series of decisions that I made to be strong, to try to look normal, try to look like I wasn't troubled, to try to not feel, to try to not even know what made me feel something. And so another part of my healing was to deal with all those decisions in my heart. And of course, with every one of those decisions, which we call inner vows, to forgive each person who tempted me to make those decisions and to repent for making them. I think each person tends toward the sexual problem that fits their temperament. And so I had two sexual problems that I fell into. One was uh, compulsive masturbation, because that's an inward thing. If you disconnect, you've got to connect with somebody. And so you're not as likely to, to become a sex addict involving other partners as you are involved, become a sex addict involving yourself. And so that was a very difficult problem for many years. And the other problem was that although I never fell into the homosexual lifestyle, I never, never once crossed the line and, and committed an, an act, I was very, very much tempted. And the reason being that when those boys did what they did, 
I felt what was in their hearts and I decided I don't want a man's heart because what's in men's hearts is ugly. And my dad back then, not being as healed as he was, as he is now, nowadays he cries all the time. <laughs> Every time he gets up to speak, he cries. Back then he didn't know how. And, and he didn't know how to show that he had the raging emotions that I had deep inside me. So I couldn't, I couldn't relate. And my dad had a, he had that boyish roughness, that, that good, healthy, boy energy, man energy. And since I had decided that that was ugly, it was evil, I couldn't relate to that. And so I, I was cut off from receiving something from him that could activate something in me that could tell me who I was. One of the first healings was I just suppressed the attractions and tried to say no to them. And finally, under the stress of my first year of seminary, they became so strong, I almost fell, but I did not. And I went to somebody for, for inner healing to explore the roots. And, and of course, she knew it, it had a lot to do with not connecting with him for various reasons. And she said, have you forgiven your dad for this and this, for not being able to connect to you emotionally, for not being able to, being able to reach beyond himself and come and find you? And I said, I have a hundred times, and I hate him just as much the next day. And she said, forgiveness is not the cessation of a feeling. If that was so, then suppression would have worked. <laughs> Forgiveness is simply an act of the cross. And if you can't change the feeling, then you simply go to the cross and you appropriate the gift of the cross. And you trust that the feelings will eventually follow. If you have been the victim of a child predator, I want you to know that God wants to heal the wounds caused by the evil that was done to you. He has some experience himself in being brutally tortured by men and knows well the pain that evil men inflict upon others. Jesus Christ can identify with you in your grief, and even more, he can send forth divine power to heal your wounds as you enter into relationship with him. If you are conflicted about your male identity because a man molested you, God can impart to you the missing pieces. If a fear of woman has arisen because your mother or some other woman molested you, he can cast out that fear by the power of his love in a relationship with you. Let God tell you who you are. He's the one who made you. Your wounds, your temptations, your fears and self-doubts are schemes of the enemy to keep you from being the mighty man of God that he created you to be. Don't allow evil to define you anymore. Let Jesus come into your life and begin restoring what the devil has stolen. Allow him to turn your life into something powerful and redemptive so that Satan rues the day that he ever sent someone to harm you. Look for Mark Sanford's website at the end of this program and visit our website as well for additional teaching resources that can help you in your healing process. It's purepassion.us. And until next week, I'm David Kyle Foster for all of us here at Pure Passion, reminding you to be strong and courageous for the Lord our God is with you.